Blessed of citizens, I bid you all a warm welcome to today's glorious sermon. If we were to look back through our tumultuous history, we will see a tattered trail of war and strife which has afflicted mankind since its earliest days. There was once a time where our ancestors were forced to contend with the terrible myriad of stellar enemies to be found out in the depths of space, with naught but their indefatigable will to carry them through to victory. Whilst our species has held on to this vestigial strength, we are no longer in a position where we must face off against these foes with but the lonesome might of our faith upon our backs. We are all well aware of the noble chapters of the Adeptus Astartes, whose battle brothers stand ever vigilant against the darkest of adversaries who would seek out nothing but our complete and utter downfall. But the chapters which we know them as today didn't always exist in these forms. Looking back to the 30th millennium, we will see that the innumerable chapters were contained within 20 great legions, although two of them have long since been expunged from all official records, with many a conspiracy theory existing regarding their mysterious fates. An important point to note here is that whilst the Emperor himself still walked among us during these times, he did not intend to act as the leader of their armies, and this responsibility would instead fall to the beings known as Primarchs. These were genetically engineered demigods, whose own DNA was derived from the holy materials of the Emperor, and they were to be his sons, who could not only direct the great legions, but would also stand over the Imperium as its ever watchful guardians. Unfortunately, however, fate ever seems to have a capricious sense of humour, and this grand plan for humanity seemed to have been doomed from the start. We have all heard tales of the Horus heresy, where the children of the Emperor turned to seek favour from the dark gods of the warp, sparking a rebellious civil war which deformed and crippled the Imperium into the dogged state which we see it as today. But the heresy is not to be our topic for this sermon. And instead, we are to delve into the secrets of the Primarch project. With the return of two of the fabled loyalist figures as a recent memory in our minds, it is high time that we all learnt of the secrets behind their inception and creation. We will first investigate the Emperor's early genetic experiments, where he formed the fated armies, which were to act as the foundation to the later Astartes. After this, we will learn of how he produced the Primarchs themselves, before finally looking into some of their physiological and psychological features. But without further ado, let us look back to the earliest days of the Imperium. Historians have categorized the long march of humanity into several distinct time periods. But our story today begins at the end of the time named as the Age of Strife. Even with the chaos of the galaxy today, many would consider this age as being perhaps the darkest and most terrible of times for our predecessors. It followed on from the veritable golden period, known as the Dark Age of Technology, where mankind wrangled control of the various sciences to ascend into a new plane of power within the galaxy. Unfortunately, however, as the name would suggest, there was a terrible cost to all of these experimental innovations. Not all of the discoveries and inventions of this time were destined to be beneficial tools for us and were instead fated to become dark warnings against the terrible destructive potential of unrestrained technologies. Whilst, yes, true wonders such as the standard template constructs or the genomic gift known as the navigator gene were fabricated here, it was also during this period that the fabled abominable intelligences wrought a bloody havoc upon our ancestors. 
I will not recount the full events of this period today, but following on from a series of incredibly lengthy conflicts and cataclysmic warp storms, this golden age of humanity was brought to a crashing halt and the age of strife began with earnest. Worlds were isolated from one another. Entire sectors were consumed by anarchic wars. Rogue AI plagued the stars. Mutant subspecies of man appeared, and it truly seemed that all which had been built up during the age of technology was to be reduced to ruin. A great many of the worlds of man were tarnished from once shining examples of civilization down into little more than scattered tribes of barbaric savages where their only aspirations were to simply survive to see the next morning. As heretical as it may be to admit this, holy terror itself was not safe from this great fall. Our home world also experienced a complete breakdown, primarily caused by the occlusion of the entire soul system from the rest of the galaxy by a protracted warp storm, which lasted for several thousand years until it finally began to subside. During this period of isolation, however, the governed practices of the planet collapsed, with almost none caring to preserve the ancient artifacts of civilization which had endured from our earliest days. Instead, raving tribes of techno-barbarians ruled supreme. Various warlords would rise and fall, being supplanted by other, more powerful warriors who sought to claim their vast territories as their own. This constant state of tribal warfare persisted for several millennia, with the entire world bearing witness to the rapid deterioration and destruction of its natural environments. But this time of war was not to last indefinitely. During the 29th millennium, a warlord who stood above all others rose to prominence, and this figure was none other than the Emperor himself. He had long awaited for the right time to make himself known to humanity, but with the waning and calming tides of the surrounding warp storms, he knew that this was the most opportune moment to unite the great cradle of man. The Emperor, gifted with a preternatural skill set in genomic engineering, foresaw the need to create a biologically enhanced army which could sweep the world of terror and once again bring mankind under a unified banner. As such, he formed the Legionnaires Cartagis, although they were more commonly known as the Thunder Warriors. At the time, these elite troops stood as the absolute pinnacle of what a human could possibly hope to ascend to. They had been formulated to act as living weapons, which none could ever hope to oppose in the open field of battle. They were physically magnificent, being far stronger and more savage than even the present-day Primaris Marines. And so it should be clear to you that they would go on to be utterly unmatched by the various war tribes of terror. Bearing thick metal armor, replete with the finest of technological advancements from the time, they waged a bloody war against the techno-barbarians where they subjugated those who were willing and exterminated any who posed even a modicum of opposition to the Emperor. The warriors were organized into 20 legions, with each being led by a figure known as a Primarch. Make no mistakes regarding this, for these leaders are not to be compared with the Primarchs who will appear later in this tale. At this stage, the Thunder Warrior Primarchs were no different to the other genetic troops, and it was simply a title which was granted to the individual who would stand at the head of their army. Despite their prowess in battle, the Thunder Warriors were by no means perfect, and many today would consider them as being nothing short of abominable failures who should never have been graced with the gift of life. Even with the skills of the Emperor, the genome of his warriors was an utterly unstable mess. Rampant mutations plagued his armies, and their legions were rife with calamities which simply had no possible cure. 
Some warriors were prone to falling into a state of intense bloodlust and rage, where they would disobey all orders given to them, favoring instead to butcher and maim whatever poor innocent stood before them. Others, however, would simply drop dead at the most inopportune of times, with their bloated and engorged organs finally succumbing to the weight of errant genomic manipulation. These problems resulted in many living out their short lives as something akin to a rabid dog being barely kept in line by the emperor, as their bodies violently rejected their genetic augmentations. Whilst they were categorically successful in aiding the emperor through his unification of terror, they would never be able to fulfill his visions for galactic conquest. Their crude minds were incapable of embodying his vision, and their combined problems would prohibit them from ever being able to safely carry out humanity across the stars. Because of this, the emperor did not see a future where the Thunder Warriors had a place by his side. With a pragmatic sense of duty, he therefore ordered for a great purge to commence. Historical records indicate that during the 30th millennia, as the Unification Wars came to an end, the Emperor instructed his custodian guards to slaughter the remaining Thunder Warriors atop the peak of Mount Ararat, bringing this era of tribal war to its bloody end. I will quickly note here that the official records of this event listed the Thunder Warriors as having valiantly died during a battle against their techno-barbarian foes. However, this was simply propaganda sent out to the early followers of the Emperor. He did not wish for the secrets of his purge to be widely known, and so this story was sent as a cover-up to hide that he did in fact betray the warriors who led him to victory across terror. There are dubious sources suggesting that a scattered few of their legion survived this ordeal. However, that is to be a story for another day. But regardless of this, the Thunder Warriors were now widely considered as extinct, and the Emperor had turned his eyes towards the stars, where he wished to once again unite humanity under the banner of a single stellar empire. In the wake of the Unification Wars, the Emperor was forced to admit that despite their effectiveness in battle, that the Thunder Warriors had been a failure, and yet he still had a distinct need for a similar force. His ideal army would be one which could match with the strength of his former Jean soldiers, but with an increased sense of stability and an iron-hard devotion to his every command. They were to cleave their way through the cosmos, annihilating any foes in their path, and humanity would then be safe to spread out and colonize the various worlds of the galaxy, following along in their righteous path of blood. With this goal in mind, he set about with his first experiments to create the Legionnaires Astartes, the Space Marines. They would be organized into 20 great legions in a fashion which mirrored the Thunder Warriors. However, they were to be far more disciplined and regimented than their predecessors. In order to best ensure that they would be held under a distinct sense of controlled restraint, the Emperor made the decision to expunge some of the more human of emotions from the new Astartes. In theory, this would make them less prone to emotional outbursts, and it would be far less likely for them to disobey commands due to moral or psychological reasons. In any case, aside from the Astartes themselves, the Emperor also saw fit for the great legions to be once again led by a Primarch. However, for this generation, they were to be markedly different than that of a regular Marine. He saw the true potential held by a figure who could lead an entire legion of his warriors and that their applications would surely be useful, not only in situations of war, but also in matters of governance. With this in mind, he made the fated decision that the Primarchs were to be his sons. 
They would carry the unwavering will of humanity with them throughout the stars, and through their strengths, mankind would prevail against the odds. Even in the darkest of nights, where it seemed that victory could not be reached, the Primarchs would break through leading mankind as a shining beacon towards its destined place as the ultimate rulers of the galaxy. The demigod figures were not to be named as his sons in merely a symbolic way, as they would in fact carry within them his own holy DNA. This would cause many of his own transcendent features and traits to manifest themselves within both their flesh as well as within their souls, but this was an essential part of his plan. For these young kings to act as the shepherds of humanity, they could only ever be trusted if they truly exemplified the emperor himself, and so they could only be successful in their mission if they themselves had his strength within them. In addition, the Primarchs were always intended to be at the apex of what humanity was capable of. They were designed to be far stronger, taller, more intelligent, more durable, faster and more resilient than that of even an Astartes, let alone compared to a standard human. Such was the extent of their gifts that not even the legendary custodian guards would be able to contend with a Primarch. But as I had stated, this was all by design. It was one thing to produce these figures to act as the warlords to his armies, but his plan for the Primarchs went so much further than simple acts of carnage. After the galaxy had been united, and once humanity had joined together to serve within the complex web of the Imperium, he had intended for some of the Primarchs to take up more administrative duties, all to support the blossoming growth of this new human empire. With that being said, there were some within their ranks who were never intended to act as anything but warriors. And if the events of the heresy had never occurred, it is likely that some of the Primarchs would have simply lived out the rest of their lives as generals within the Imperial armies. But regardless of their planned destinies, let us now look back to learn of how it was that the Emperor brought his children into existence. I will start by saying that there is some debate regarding the actual starting date of the Primarch project. Some believe that it began before the inception of even the Thunder Warriors, whereas others will claim that it started during the Unification Wars, but records from these days are so sparse and so damaged that we may never know the exact timeline of events. With that being said, however, based on our knowledge of the Emperor coming forward during the 29th millennium, and of terror becoming united during the 30th millennium, we can say that the project almost certainly began between these two periods of our history. Such was the importance of this mission, that the Emperor trusted very few people with the knowledge of its existence. He knew that these figures would later go on to lead humanity through the stars, and so any potential for meddlesome interference could simply not be tolerated. As such, it was only his closest advisers and most accomplished of scientific minds who were brought under his personal fold to join in this most vital of tasks. Chiefly among his colleagues, there were two who stood out from the rest. The first was a perpetual known as Erda. She had aided the Emperor for countless years during his rise to power, and along with Malkador the Sigilite, she was one of the few perpetual figures who trusted in his new vision for humanity's future. I will quickly note here that a perpetual is a most curious and mysterious phenomenon. They are humans who are seemingly immortal. And whilst many were naturally born with this ability, there are some who were artificially induced into becoming an eternal being. Regardless of their origins, however, they have walked with humanity since their birth, 
and many would see their life's purpose as being to guide our species to a brighter, more prosperous future as some kind of guiding hand acting from the shadows. Erda, along with some of her contemporaries, believed that perpetuals were the next stage of human evolution and that eventually all within our species would converge to this point of immortality. The Emperor shared in this belief, however he wished to accelerate the process, and so the Primarch project was partially intended to be the first iteration of his plan to produce and introduce artificial, perpetual humans to the galaxy. Many of the fellow perpetuals who had joined with the Emperor during his rise to power scoffed at this notion and chose to abandon or even betray him but many of their names have been lost to history. Erda, however, was more than happy to assist him in his new goal of bringing humanity into a new, eternal future. The second trusted companion of the Emperor was an erudite scientist who went by the name of Amar Astarte. A Terran native, she had spent her early life working with several of the techno-barbarian warlords of the world, where she promised to aid them in producing their own armies of genetically enhanced super-soldiers. Unfortunately, however, their crude facilities were never built up to the standards which she required for such a grand endeavor, and so her talents were sadly wasted on projects which were never destined to end as anything other than a failure. This was to be the case until she eventually met with the Emperor. She saw and understood his vision for humanity, and trusted that he would be the only one who could provide her with the resources which she needed to finally produce her gene warriors. As such, she pledged herself to his cause, and for her loyalty, she was named as the director of the Emperor's Biotechnical Division, where she would manage and lead the finest of genetic engineers who had similarly thrown their lab coats in with the Emperor. Both Erda and Amar Astarte were two of the brightest minds when it came to the fine art of genomic tuning, and they both proved to be utterly invaluable to the completion of this grand project. As their research and testing continued, however, it soon became clear that the Emperor's original plan of producing children who were essentially clones of himself was perhaps a task which was marred by his own arrogance. The genetic samples which they had extracted and experimented with were far too unstable to be used within a living being, and due to the destined roles which the Primarchs were intended to take, they had to find a method of stabilizing his unique DNA. Thankfully, however, they already knew of who could provide a sample which was comparable in its nature to that of the Emperor's, Erda. The Perpetual was similarly distinct to the rest of humanity, and yet she was innately human, making her a perfect match who could resolve this great hurdle. With this, her rare genetic material was sampled and commingled with the DNA of the Emperor to produce 20 exceptional embryos. These were then heavily modified and altered by Erda, Amar Astarte and the Emperor, all in order to ensure that they could only ever grow into stable beings who possessed a near divine power. Such was the importance of this mission that the budding embryos were under constant supervision by the senior scientists of the Biotechnical Division. There was never a moment where they were left unsupervised or where measurements and vital signs were not being constantly analyzed for even the slightest perturbation. These beings were to be grown as perfected gods, and so they were nurtured with the most astute of care available from the finest minds of mankind. With all this being said, however, I would be remiss to not mention a fringe opinion on the topic. Whilst the following is a most heretical view, there should be no secrets kept here. And so despite the source for this statement being taken from a demon prince known as Ingethal the Ascended, I will share it with you today. 
The Hellspawn claims that the Emperor and his companions were unable to formulate the specific genomic traits needed for his progeny on their own, and so he was forced to take a darker path to achieve his goal. It is said that he partook in a most forbidden ritual, where he reached into the terrible warp itself to unspool and reform the genetic makeup of his children, all so that they would be perfected in his idealized image. It has long been suspected that he learnt of this technique in his distant past during an expedition onto the savage world of Molech, where he delved through a warp portal to engage in a dark bargain with the chaos gods themselves. And it is from their gift that he first conceived of the idea to produce his sons. The demon prince has gone on to claim that in return for this gift, that the emperor promised to spread the teachings of chaos through to all of humanity, but that the anathema always intended to trick the dark gods and refuse their obliged request. It is speculated that this betrayal may have been what prompted the four gods to involve themselves with the fates of the Primarchs, meaning that perhaps the events of the Horus heresy and the ensuing flourishment of chaos throughout the galaxy is all some form of revenge against the Emperor's broken bargain. But regardless of how he came to know of this method, the deed had been done, and he had consorted with our eternal enemies in the hopes that he could avoid their dark touch, all for the benefit of humanity. Whilst his intentions were pure, there can be nothing gained from the warp without losing something in the process. The genomes of the young Primarchs, whilst improved from this procedure, were forever tainted by the chaos of the Immaterium, and they would forever be cursed to carry aspects of its foul touch within their very souls. It is important to note here that the genetic instability caused by the vile taint of the warp was not to be limited only to the Primarchs themselves. Each one of the 20 demigods would have a unique genome, and from this the Emperor was to derive the material needed to produce the armies of the legionnaires Astartes. Because of their origin, these soldiers would also be afflicted by the corrupted traits of the warp, and although none could have anticipated this, they would go on to plague the Marines for their entire history, lasting until this very day. In any case, let us return now to the young Primarchs, growing within the bubbling vats of the secret laboratories of Terra. The actual location for this gene lab was found deep below the foundations of the Imperial Palace, in a facility which was known only to the Emperor and his most trusted of companions. As I had stated, each of the genomes were to be unique to the specific Primarch, as the Emperor had intended for them to each serve a specific purpose within the Imperium once they grew into maturity. They had been manipulated and respooled to contain esoteric mutations, all of which would allow them to best live up to their destined purpose. For example, the sorcerer King Magnus the Red was to be one of the greatest of psychers throughout the entire galaxy, and so his was disproportionately graced with far more of the Emperor's own psychic genes than of his brother's. It should be important to note here that it is rumoured that some of these mutations and genes were said to have been sourced from Xenos DNA. For instance, the Primarch of the Space Wolves, Lehman Russ, may have been imbued with canine DNA samples potentially explaining the feral and dog-like nature of his character and of his legion. With that being said, not all of the mutations were intentional and there were many flaws which would manifest themselves in nefarious ways. Primarily due to the touch of the warp, the Primarchs were doomed to display features or harbour innate traits which would plague them for the rest of their days. 
For example, the night haunter, Conrad Kurz, was cursed with the malign gift of foresight, and for his entire life he was beset by prophetic visions of the future, which partly drove him to madness from the sheer terror that they instilled within him. The changes made to the Primarchs was not solely focused on their physiology or psychic abilities, but it also greatly affected their personalities. As I had stated, many of the sons were destined to act as administrative statesmen within the Imperium once the Great Crusade had concluded, and so it would be of a great benefit if they had an overwhelming sense of charisma to them. The sheer magnetism of their being was carefully engineered so that all would follow their commands, and this would allow them to effectively direct humanity through times of peace, ushering the galaxy into a new era of harmony and prosperity under their rule. With that being said, however, these specific mutations did not always translate into the Primarch being a more personable figure. By no fault of their own, some of them had such traumatic and turbulent upbringings that their perception of the galaxy became skewed and so they would forever see regular humans as being beneath them and not worthy of their presence. Similarly, their personalities would often clash with one another or with that of the emperor, meaning that the brothers were far more likely to engage in reckless disputes between each other. I should note here that the problems which plagued the Primarchs were not to be bore upon their shoulders alone, as their Astartes progeny would also be forced to suffer from these malignities. The legions of the Space Marines were to be born from the gene seed of their Primarch father, and so they too would be afflicted by the prior mentioned mutations. These changes varied wildly in their severity, but all were affected to some degree. For instance, the Legion of the Thousand Sons were blessed with the increased psychic abilities of Magnus. However, they were cursed with such an unstable genome that their brothers would all at some point inevitably fall victim to a condition known as the Flesh Change. From here, the Marine would rapidly deteriorate and devolve into a mindless mass of mutated flesh bereft of thought or soul. There was no known cure, and once a brother had fallen to this change, they could only be granted the Emperor's mercy. Other legions, such as the Word Bearers, were seemingly rather free from mutations such as this. Their own genome was seen as being one of the most stable which had been produced by the Emperor's genitors. However, there was an unseen burden to this. Those within their legion were uncharacteristically loyal to their Primarch, Lorgar Aurelian. And whilst this may not seem like such a negative point, we have to wonder if the word bearers are cursed with a lack of free will, where they are completely subservient to every whim and command of their Primarch. With all these genetic changes, the Primarchs were only ever destined for greatness. However, there was an inescapable drawback to this engineering project. Partly due to being sourced from the Emperor's own DNA, and partly due to the influences of the warp-born techniques which brought them into being, the souls of the young demigods would shine as brightly through the immaterium as a lighthouse would on a dark night. This made them particularly susceptible to the gaze of demons, and to the meddlesome temptations of the dark gods who would inevitably flock to the great blazing souls of the Primarchs like a moth would to a flame. Anticipating the tampering intrusions of the dark gods, the Emperor placed the growing embryos behind a series of mighty Gela fields and inscribed the gene vats with arcane glyphs of protection which were intended to shield his progeny and ward off the foul influences of the warp. These precautions, however, were unfortunately not successful. We must remember that the Emperor, whilst deific, was but a man, 
And even with his most well-conceived of protections, his plans can also meet with failure. There are two main theories as to how this project met its chaotic end, and I will lay them both out for you here, where you may choose as to which you personally believe in. The first pertains to Erda. Even though she was akin to a mother to the Primarchs, as the project proceeded, the Emperor had forbade her from ever having contact with them. He told her that they were made to be tools, not as children, and that he needed to mould them into their role as galactic conquerors above all else. The Great Crusade was still in its earliest phase of planning, but these 20 demigods were utterly essential to its success, and without them, he did not believe that humanity would be able to wrangle control over the vast expanse of the stars. Hearing of this cold and calculated future which the Emperor intended for her progeny, she fell into a state of despair and forlorn sorrow. In a desperate attempt to save the infant Primarchs from his soulless plans, she invoked a forbidden ritual sourced from her ancient past, which caused reality itself to buckle and break. She had manifested a mighty and terrible warp storm of such ferocity that it overpowered the Geller fields and glyphs of the Emperor. From here, the aspiring angels were pulled into the warp from where they would be scattered across the galaxy, all in the hopes that they would be able to live out their lives without the heartless influences of the Emperor looming over their heads. Upon hearing of this, he was enraged at her betrayal. She was seen as being one of the few loyal companions who had persisted through the Unification Wars, and yet, at this crucial moment, she had cast his children to the stellar winds. Despite this, there was to be no retaliation against her. Erda was outcast from the palace, never again being permitted to return to sabotage his best laid of plans. I should mention here that, whilst Erda fervently claimed that it was by her own design to summon the warp portal, that there is another interpretation of her actions. The ever-reviled harbinger of chaos, Erebus, once stated that the dark gods were in fact responsible for this calamity. He claimed that they had subtly influenced and manipulated her into taking these actions, but we will never know if this is true or just the maddened raving of a despicable traitor. The second theory regarding the loss of the Primarchs once again comes from the hellish mouth of a heretic, but it is still one which we must consider. The demon prince which I previously mentioned, named as Ingethel the Ascended, was a most troublesome entity, and her influences may very well have caused this great calamity to unfold. However, as we will soon discuss, the events which she brought into being may have very well been a parlour trick, with the following experience being naught but smoke and mirrors to manipulate the errant space marines. From within the Eye of Terror, a contingent of word-bearers Astartes believed themselves to have been sent backwards in time by the demon, only to manifest themselves within the sacred gene labs of terror. The traitor known as Argel Tal peered into the incubation vats, spying the amorphous shapes which would soon grow into the Primarchs who would drown the galaxy in flames, but killing them was not his mission. The demon Ingethel prompted him to destroy the mighty Geller fields, as this would allow the Chaos Gods to rip open their own warp portal and jettison the young infants away from the guidance of the Emperor. The heretic obliged, and from his perspective, he would have created something of a self-fulfilling time loop, and if you believe these actions to be true, then the events of the heresy could very well be from his doing. It is possible that these two theories converge, in that once the Geller fields were destroyed, perhaps the gods then influenced Erda to manifest her warp portal. But, I do not believe this to be the case. 
With these events in mind, we must consider as to whether or not these actions actually occurred, or if they were simply a warp-born vision invoked by the demonic hellspawn as a trial for the Astartes to endure. We must remember that the never-born are innately deceptive and self-centered beings who care only for the furtherment of their own plans, and so lying to a group of impressionable heretics as to the nature of their expedition is a highly likely explanation for this entire situation. Perhaps it wished to see whether or not the Marines could be trusted, and so it conjured up this mystical yet artificial scenario purely to see whether or not they would oblige with the requests of chaos or betray them in the final moments. Alas, we will never know if this time loop was real or simply another worldly experience built up to further push the Astartes down into the abyssal reaches of heresy. Whilst you may choose in which theory you believe, I would like to once again remind you that the demonkin should never be trusted and so I do not personally believe that this experience was real, and it is far more likely for these events to have been simply a warp-induced hallucination brought about by a meddlesome and loathsome creature. This would leave the actions of Erda as being the likeliest cause for the formation of the rift. But it is still valuable to hear of other interpretations, even if they came from the mouth of a demon. Despite these theories, some of the Primarchs actually believe that this scattering had been a part of the Emperor's plan all along. They think that he orchestrated these events since he foresaw the unfurling of the heresy as being an essential step in his long-term goals for humanity. We may never know the actual truth here, but whoever is responsible for scattering the Primarchs through space can surely be blamed to some degree for the great betrayal which ensued and the oceans of blood spilled throughout the calamity of the Horus heresy is most assuredly on their hands. With the incubation vats of the young Primarchs now jettisoned out into the chaos of the warp, some of you will have expected for them to be consumed by starving demons who would voraciously feast upon the succulent souls of these enigmatic beings. But, as we have discussed, the dark powers of the warp saw these demigods as being integral to their plans, and so they were kept safe on their calamitous journey. Another perspective of this would be that when Erda cast the children through the warp portal, that she invoked a mystical ritual to protect them from the clawing grasps of the never-born, and so it could very well have been thanks to her grace that they were kept safe. In any case, the Primarchs were destined to be scattered out across the galaxy, where they would land upon distant worlds, stranded from the protections they once had upon Holy Terror. The actual planets they arrived at were incredibly varied, but typically they were old colonies of man, which had been first seeded prior to the Age of Strife. But as we are all well aware, this period of galactic history is marked by the chaotic warp storms which isolated huge portions of the galaxy from outside contact. And so some of these worlds had degenerated into a state of pure barbarism. For instance, the well-named world of Barbarus was a toxic and noxious world, ruled over by a species of Xenos which would hunt and prey upon the fleeting survivors of man who huddled together for warmth around the dying embers of their old civilization. This was to be the home of the Primarch Mortarion, and the horrific conditions and trials which he was forced to endure here forever scarred the demigod, potentially being the primary cause of him being pushed away from the light of the Emperor and into the arms of the Dark Gods. Conversely, however, Robut Giliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, landed upon the tranquil and civilized world of Macrag. 
Though the surrounding star system had fallen into a relatively poor state, it was still able to provide equitable conditions to its citizens. And once they discovered Gilliman, he was treated exceptionally well, being elevated as an administrative agent within the prodigious world. But regardless of the worlds which they landed upon, the important point was that the Primarchs were lost and there was no guarantee that they would ever be reunited with Terra ever again. This was a titanic loss for the Emperor. His plans rested upon the unique skill set and abilities of the Primarchs to lead his armies across the galaxy, and without them, he was no longer sure that he could unite humanity under the stable banner which he once held. Nevertheless, he was forced to adapt and overcome this calamity, not only to reunite mankind with one another, but also to once again be joined with his sons at his side. As I had previously stated, the great legions of the Astartes were to be formed from the gene seed of their Primarchs, since it would innately tie them to the figure who would stand as their spiritual and genetic liege. Thankfully, he had already isolated the unique DNA of each of his sons years before their loss to the warp, and so his goal of producing the armies of the Space Marines was not to be abandoned. The unique gene seed was refined, and the organs derived from this material were grown in great vats, all of which were made to be ready for implantation into the prospective Astartes. Through his conquest of terror, the Emperor had amassed a huge roster of the strongest of humans who he encountered, and it was from their strength which would soon carry the rest of humanity out through the stars. They were taken to be incubated, trained and equipped into becoming the Legionnaires Astartes, and once ready, they stood as the first iteration of the great Space Marines. Even though they could never live up to the unparalleled majesty of their Primarch, they were still tremendously mighty warriors in their own right, who would carve out a home for humanity throughout the vast expanse of our galaxy. The Astartes were true super soldiers who could be mass produced, creating 20 vast legions which would theoretically be able to form their own empire with their imposing military strength. But being united, they would carry mankind on their angelic backs, and they would claim us our birthright within the cold void of the cosmos. I should note here that not everyone was so enamored by the existence of the Marines. Amar Astarte, head of the Emperor's own biotechnical division and grand architect of their genetic makeup, saw through the facade of glory and knew of the irreparable flaws which existed within these fated children. Perhaps far more than anyone else, she was all too well aware of the rampant mutations which would forever plague the sons of the Imperium. And although it pained her, this was a point which she chose to intentionally overlook. That was until the Primarchs themselves were lost. She saw the Gene Fathers as being something of a point of stability who would be able to anchor the great legions. But without their guiding hands, she feared that the creation of the Marines would herald the downfall of man and that all would be doomed from their wanton roaming throughout the stars. In the wake of the Unification Wars and following on from the scattering of the Primarchs, Amar Astarte joined with the rebellious forces of the Arbites, Grand Provost Marshal Uwoma Kandawaya and surviving Thunder Warriors Primarch Ushotan to strike against the heart of the fledgling Imperium. Whilst the motives for this revolt varied from member to member, we shall only discuss the reasoning and actions of Astarte today. As I stated, she had become disenchanted with the notion of fatherless marines crusading out into the galaxy, and she feared that they would lead as a rampant force which could never be wrangled into submission without the guiding light of their lost Primarchs. 
As such, she formed a diverse army of mercenaries, turncoats, and even genetically engineered super soldiers known as the Castellan Exemplars, and led them directly into the skeletal underbelly of the Imperial Palace, intending to destroy the Emperor's lab once and for all. It was here, however, that she was to meet her fated end. A member of the Custodian Guard known as Samonas confronted Astarte within the Imperial Dungeons, having been ordered by Constantine Valdor to apprehend and eliminate the rogue scientist if she was not to be compliant. Though he was able to subdue her, he could not prevent her from partially carrying out her mission. With an earth-shaking explosion, Amar Astarte detonated an internal charge, engulfing herself and the entire lab in an expansive fireball, and with this, her erudite skill set was forever lost to the Imperium. Though she was unsuccessful in bringing a grand halt to the inception of the Space Marines, she did in fact destroy much of the contained knowledge which pertained to the creation of the Primarchs. And although the Emperor had several backups of this data, the loss of his lab was still a major blow to this plan of his. It is rumored within the Custodian Guard that the Emperor was well aware of this growing rebellion, long before it erupted into an outright conflict. They claim to have been warned of this eventuality, and that it was permitted to occur simply because it best suited the needs of the Imperium and that it would never be allowed to proceed to a point where it could possibly endanger the grand schemes which the Emperor had set in motion for humanity. We will never know if this is true, but the space within the genetic laboratory which Amar Astarte brought to ruin was soon to be repurposed. From its cavernous crater did the Emperor ordain for the fabled gateway of the human webway project to be constructed. And so perhaps he did in fact intend for this insurrection to occur, simply to clear the area for his new planned venture. In any case, though there had been several great calamities, the twenty young Primarchs were alive, albeit lost within the great void of space. But because of this, one of the primary missions of the Great Crusade was shifted from reuniting humanity to re-establishing contact with the lost children of the Emperor, as they still had a vital role to play in the formation of this new Imperium. Leading the twenty legions of the Astartes, he set out into the inky depths of space, carrying with him the unbreakable will of humanity with the ardent need to provide us with a permanent home across the entirety of the galaxy. Every star was to be ours. Every planet to be ruled by the men and women who made up the Imperium, and none would be permitted to stand against our great expansion, as the void itself was always destined to be our great birthright. Every lost colony would once again be united to serve our mighty species. Insubordinate or treacherous governors would be brought to heel under the weight of angels' wings, and mankind would rule across the void, carving out its own future as an indelible and irrefutable point of pride across the stars. Dearest of citizens, this shall bring us to our conclusion for today's sermon. Though this does not spell the end of our tales regarding the Primarchs, I hope that it has elucidated some of the Emperor's secrets and intentions regarding their inception. We are cursed to know that even his own magnanimous plans did not unfurl in the most opportune of ways. The cataclysmic damage wrought by the events of the Horus Heresy have still left an indelible scar across the galaxy, and so we are forced to forever bear witness to this, his greatest of failures. As I stated previously, some of the Primarchs landed upon worlds which provided a tough but nurturing upbringing, whereas others were forced to endure a truly horrifying childhood, which was destined to ever leave its mark upon the young demigods. Perhaps if his sons had been kept upon terror and raised according to his grand plan, then maybe the events of the heresy would have not occurred, 
and perhaps humanity would have been led into a new golden age. But alas, we will never know of this. During the 31st millennium, after being recovered from the advancing fleets of the Great Crusade, some of the Primarchs did in fact suspect that the Emperor had planned for their loss to occur, and even that the events of the heresy were all part of his foreseen future for humanity. Other figures, including Malkador the Sigilite, had claimed that the Emperor chose to turn the Primarchs upon one another, as it would allow him to purge the most feral or unstable elements of his great project from the Imperium, leaving only the purest and most faithful to humanity as its eternal guardians. Perhaps there could be some merit to this theory. He knew that several legions, along with their Primarchs, were cursed with irreparable genetic flaws, and these individuals could never be expected to coexist within a peaceful stellar empire along with their more amicable brothers. In some ways, this would mirror his actions taken with the Thunder Warriors, although in a less decisive and more pragmatic way. But regardless of the causes of the heresy, the Primarch project should still be considered as one of his most tangible of legacies within the galaxy. Though some have since died, been lost, or even ascended as demon princes, the sons of the Emperor are undeniably demigods in their own right, and their actions will forever continue to shape the galaxy, even long after their own inevitable deaths.